Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Thanks again, listeners, for gracing me with a little bit of your time this week. I have an exciting conversation today. You know, I've been doing this a long time. My mom had Alzheimer's for 20 years, and I had never heard of a dementia doula. And joining me is Mary Ann Oglesby Southerly. Did I get all that right? You got it right. Woo! I forgot Woo. to tell you, I'm really good at butchering people's names. <laughs> and you are That's a all dem- right. <laughs> ah, mm-hmm. It's just, it's, it's always been that way. So yep. I try, but I'm still really bad. <laughs> And I may have to close the door because one of my dogs decided to bark. We'll see. Anyway, thank you for joining me. Why don't you start by telling us your background and we'll go from there. And you could tell us all about what a dementia doula is. <laughs> well, it's really funny because I, it's something I've always done, but it didn't have a name. So um, I, it's so I thought, you know, I'm an end of life doula as well. And so I loved the end of life doula work. However, for people living with dementia, and that's what I've worked for with for and with the last 25 years has been people living with dementia. And so I thought, well, end of life doulas are great, but they're end of life. They're a short time period before death. And so but for people living with dementia, You really have to have a relationship with them many, many months before the end of life to know what they really want or what their family even knows what they want. And so I I had a podcast with Barbara Carnes and uh, she said, I said something about dementia doula on there and her face, because it was a Zoom call, you know, her face was like, what? You know, she wanted to say something, but she couldn't because we were doing that podcast. So when it was over, she goes, what is the dementia doula? She had never heard of it either. Now, I think there's some like Australia might have some um, England might. And and it's different in the fact that as an old nurse in a family practice, that's where I was a family practice nurse years ago. I saw dementia come on the scene as not being called dementia, it was called lots of things, hardening of the (laughs) arteries, psychosis, um, (laughs) bipolar. They didn't have a name for it, but the people I saw that we took care of that were older, they just didn't act the same. So that's where the dementia came in. And that's where I got so interested is that they just were different. And so I went to another town in Texas after then and ended up in a program similar to what I have here in Nashville. So it was a respite-based program, short-term respite for people living with dementia. And they thrived. They thrived because it was short-term. It wasn't an all-day event. Their families brought them, dropped them off, just like they do where I work at the veranda, and pick them up in a short span of time. But we have an average of two and a half years for somebody living with dementia coming through our door, sitting at the same table with their same (laughs) friends in the same room. And so it all comes very familiar to them. And so so I thought, okay, end of life doula, I get, but it's about the relationship. It's about the relationship that I have with people living with dementia, because I'm walk the walk side by side with someone living with dementia. And in fact, with the family. So when things start to get a little tough, in the journey, the family say, well, what do you suggest? You know, mama better than I do. You, you work with the dementia mama. I live with her, but it's, you see her differently than I do. And so I do think that a dementia doula has to see things from a different perspective. If you cannot see them as a whole person, if you can't see life from their point of view, then you're not going to make a good dementia doula because that's where you learn those things. You weed out the things that are dementia talk and the things that are really Marianne talk if I had dementia. So when the end of life doula thing came up, someone asked me what I talk about dementia and end of life at, at a course that they were having. And I said, okay, so I got to thinking about it and it just didn't. I've been in a lot of bedsides with people that pass away with dementia. And when everyone's standing at the foot of the bed, 
sorrowful, which is great. That's fine. I'm at the head of the bed going, goodness, look at you. <laughs> Let's sing this song we've sang for the last 10 years. Let's talk about, you know what, Miss Julia, you you told me this one time. And, and I would just talk to them. And most times they, once they heard my voice, once they heard something familiar, whatever that might be, they didn't respond like you and I are talking to each other, but there would be that opening of your eye. Or one said one time, love, really faint. Well, her daughter was at the foot of the bed and she went, oh my gosh, mama just said a word. She hasn't spoken two weeks. So it was kind of like speaking their language to them at that particular time. Had I not had a relationship with her, for almost four years for this particular lady, I wouldn't have known that I could talk to her about these hidden secrets that we had <laughs> because lots of things are hard to tell a family, you know, That's lots true. of things. It's very hard for them to understand that I can get into the person's world without them being able to, because it doesn't bother me. It doesn't bother me what they say. My, you know, my daughter's just the meanest old thing that's ever lived. And, and so you kind of, go, well, I don't think so. I, but, you know, I understand how you feel. You think that she's trying to boss you around, but she really loves you. Well, let me tell you what she did. You know, I always <laughs> tell families, I go, I know more secrets about y'all's family than <laughs> you ever would want to know. I know, you know, <laughs> but in those secrets, you can kind of go around, as my dad said, by Laura's house and figure out that there was some truth in it, mostly emotional truth. Um, people that have been abused and um, women, we have one now that her her husband abused her really bad. And so she's very scared of men. Mm. She's middle to late stages. And so I try to but she's precious when she, you can get her away from that life, from that life and talk about the life that was good to her. And there was 15 years in there where he wasn't in the picture that made it bearable. And we try to find those things. So a doula it's kind of like an investigator, a dementia doula. And you find out those things that make them tick, that make them happy. So I was certified through TIPA Snow um, in three different certifications. And I love TIPA and I've known her a long time. And we talk about that sometimes, you know, like, so what made her tick? What caused that quote, as people call it, behavior? Because if you don't understand it early on, it could still be the same way when you're sick and close to death. Don't do those things because that aggravated her. She never did like you to brush her hair to the left hand side or to the right hand side. Just <laughs> little things like that. You know, I had a lady one time I put we had makeovers. I thought it was the grandest idea in all of the world. And they looked like I mean, they just look like royalty. And the lady loved coral well the lady that did the makeup put on pink lipstick well i didn't pay any attention that she had on pink lipstick when she got through screaming in the bathroom and <laughs> stomping out of there and had washed all her makeup off she goes i hate pink lipstick and i went i forgot i said i'm so sorry and she said you should be sorry pink <laughs> is ugly you know I mean, she just and i thought something so little made such a big difference and so basically that's kind of uh, knowing someone and knowing who they are living with dementia makes a huge difference in how you can care for them in the last year of their life, the last six months of their life, ever how long that you have them. But it's more than just a quote deathbed doula work. It's a, it's a side by side caring for someone um, through a few years if you have to. So, you know, I, I love it. I think people that have a heart and can, can understand that these people are doing the best they can do with what they have. Um, I see the bad side of death with people living with dementia medications on overload mm -hmm. for those, you know, living with dementia. And so if they just knew she's aggravated because she doesn't like whatever, you don't have to give them a pill for every time they get upset, especially big 
mama jama pills that that cause them to even act worse. So um, basically, that's it. That's what a dementia doula does. It sounds simple. It's not near simple, I know, as I'm making it because, you know, it's nights with people. I was doing a class. This is just kind of an I said something about the st- new statistics out in 2022 of of dementia and caregivers. And I said, you know, it doesn't bother me to go to someone's home and sit with them for four hours if that's what it takes for that daughter or that husband to get to go out, play golf, do whatever. I'm I'm not past doing that. And they go, well, we're not we're end of life deals. We don't we're not caregivers. And I went, yeah, well, that's kind of what a doula does. Yeah, I was know? like, kind of, <laughs> kind of. You are, you know, and so, um, yeah, I, I love what I do because it it's a relationship based. It's relationship based, and it's the personhood of that person living with dementia. It's all about the personhood. It's all about who they are, who the family is, and how can you meet in the middle and find common ground and get along and understand. <laughs> It's dementia talking to you. It's really not your mother, so to speak, all the time. So Hard. do you find it somewhat easier than, say, someone like me who helped care for my mom to to step in and say, like you just said, it's not really your mom speaking. Like my mom, the more help she needed, the more angry she got and the more right. resistance she got. Right. And you would try to sweet talk her or just, you know, use all the techniques Right. And this one day she was not having any of that. And she just looked at me and she goes, oh, drop dead. <laughs> like, <laughs> thanks. <you know? laughs> and it's, yeah. you know, it, it hits your heart and it stings. It and does. It's, it's hard. Like she lived in memory care. So I didn't have to hear that, that angry side that often. Right. But if she'd lived with me, which I've mentioned on the show before would not have worked. Um, right. I would, it's like, I would not have been able to take that. And so right. is something that you do kind of help like broker the peace between the two <laughs> so that like I would understand better. So I could, I could cope with those barbs better. And, and <laughs> well, you know, that- there's, there's one thing I've learned from Tipa and it's the five I'm sorry's. And, and those five I'm sorry's are so hard to do when you are the daughter or the husband, it wears you down. But a doula could come in and say, okay, I know she's not going to do me that way, but she might a little bit. So if she said, you're just a mean old thing, you know, go, you're, so you're saying I'm being mean to you. And she'd say, yes, you're being mean to me. And then I would say, well, I am so sorry. I'm so sorry. And then she'd say, well, you better be. And so you, the more you come back, the less, the more diffused that situation can be. Does it work every time? No. And I will tell you, I am all for people placing their loved ones if that there is no other choice, but there's thousands of families living in home in rural areas. That's just not possible financially. It's not, it's not possible. Um, It's just not possible. There's not enough. It isn't. And so, in Tennessee, where I live, and we're in a rural county, so to speak, there's lots of little families living out in on farms that a doula, a doula could, should, and would be of great help to a family like that, just to maneuver what's the best avenue. So I don't, and I think there needs to be training in it. I'm working on a training module for, for that relationship-based care, that care that you can give someone as you walk beside them, having the family to understand what's happening with the person with dementia. And guess what? You can't make somebody with dementia understand what's going on with the daughter. The capabilities and the and the cognitive ability to do that is skewed at best sometimes. However, to diffuse it and give them a pal or a buddy or someone to um that they can talk to and diffuse a situation. But but it is hard. It's just hard, period. I'm mm-hmm. not saying a dementia doula will fix it all because it won't, <laughs> but it does help. It does help. And families will say to you, if you understand the disease, if you have enough knowledge about why they're doing what they're doing, and if you can say, time out, this isn't working. 
instead of letting it just blow up, just time out. Um, then I think dem- dementia doulas are a great asset. Caregivers that are trained to understand the person. Um, I did a podcast with Bishop um, Carter the other day, and he said, people see symptoms when people should see stories. That's a good statement. It's a great statement. And he said, I had to see the story with my wife. I couldn't see the symptoms. If I kept looking at the symptoms, all I could see is Alzheimer's. She had frontal temporal lobe, which was even worse. So Mm -hmm. you saw abusive behavior sometimes. Um, And so you have to see the, you have to see, you have to see them as they are. And you, you cannot see the symptoms. You have to see their story. And so if you learn their story as a dementia doula, what it was when you were five years old. Um, There's a story we did at Christmas and we ask everybody in a room that had dementia to tell us their favorite Christmas. There's something about, so she, this lady, I loved her. And she, I said, tell us about your Christmas. And she said, well, and she went into this elaborate story of her daddy in a, she lived in a two story house in Lebanon, Tennessee. And it, she lived upstairs. Her bedroom was upstairs. It was Christmas Eve. Her daddy was coming home from the war. She could not wait for him to get home. She said, I knew if I heard that train whistle. I mean, she went in great detail. We were crying. I'm telling (laughs) you, it was the story made for a Hallmark movie. It was the best story. And she said, and then I heard that train. I heard that whistle and I knew daddy was coming. I knew how far I lived. I mean, she was just going to scratch. So daddy come home for Christmas. There was the tree. Da, 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 da. So she passed away. And I asked her daughter, I said, I had, she asked me to speak at her funeral. And I said, well, I want to tell the story about Christmas. And she said, <laughs> what story? Anyway, none of it was true, except <laughs> that she lived in a two story house and she had the right city. And she did. It was it was a nice old house and he was in the war in World War Two, but he didn't come home at Christmas. But in her mind, that story gave her peace. It was her Christmas story that made the season that otherwise would be sad. Not so sad. So I, and I said, you know, her story was right as rain to her. Yeah. You know, and so it gave her great comfort. That's a dementia doula's investigative looking at what makes them be that way. And it doesn't matter if it's true or not true. Doesn't. If it makes them happy, we're not, we shouldn't say, now, mama, you know, that didn't happen like that, you know, but in her mind, it did. In her dementia world, (laughs) maybe that's the Christmas she always wanted. If so, she got it. Because we were all crying and hugging. And when she (laughs) left, she just was so excited. She had the best story of all, you know, and none of it was true except a couple of the the place in the house. So, I mean, that's kind of a doula role. You know, you have to understand the disease to go to the daughter and say, oh, I'm so sorry. You know, I, I thought it was true. I won't. She said, no, tell it, because that's who mama really was. She loved to tell a good story. And so it worked out great. It's, it's, um, I just think it's one of the best, the fun, it's fun. We, there's stories, um, in my (laughs) book, that's what I tell about It's those crazy things that, that might've been true and might not have been true, but things I've seen that was true. So, um, it's their story, not their symptom. I don't want to remember them as a behavior. That makes sense. Do you have advice on how, Somebody like myself, a family caregiver, can maybe extract some of those stories. I was starting to get better with my mom with that. Um, She remembered she was the oldest of four, and she remembered her brothers, even though one never visited. Mm -hmm. And the younger brother and the youngest sibling, her sister, would visit. But she forgot her sister, and that, that like, bothered me. And I had to get over that. But yeah. there was a day when she told me, my brothers are normal people now. And I remember thinking, oh, really? Actually, I think I said, <laughs> oh, really? Well, that's great. And in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, eh, I'm not so sure about one of them. You know, I'm like, I, I just, I guess because it struck me funny, 
I didn't I didn't have that that pang of what about your sister? Like she your my my aunt took care of my her mom, my grandmother, who had mixed dementias. Mm -hmm. And she was visiting her sister who had Alzheimer's. So I'm like, come on now, your sister's had all these problems in life. And she's this really good person who's visiting you. And you don't even remember her. It was crazy. But do you have advice on like how to pull out some of those stories? Because since my mom passed away, I've learned some things from guests who said, like, my mom would never walk next to me. Absolutely Mm -hmm. never. I could not convince her to walk elbow and elbow for safety, for conversation, nothing. She always walked behind me and it drove me bananas because I was certain that she was going to face plant on the sidewalk and I was going to be the SOB that didn't let mom catch up or, you know, I didn't care. Yeah. I'm like, I, If I slowed down, she slowed down. It was ridiculous. And this one guest said, you just said she was the oldest of four, right? And I'm like, yeah. She's just, she was walking behind these kids to keep an eye on them. I'm like, I really wish I'd known that five years you know yeah, it's it is that way it is that i mean that's a perfect example of we have they see things from their perspective from a brain that is 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 not functioning it's losing its signal and so it's the things they don't say for instance this isn't pretty but but we have a client who's the one i was telling you about that husband had abused her all those years well they divorced they they Something happened, which they ended up back together again Mm. and um, they didn't get married. And he also had dementia. So he faded away. She they would find her in there with a stick of wood. Fixing to hit him with it. So I said, "Okay, so put your thinking cap on here. The fact of the matter is she was going back in time as well. So she saw this man who looked like her husband, who she now had no, no way to control her emotions or or her compulsiveness to to do something to him. And so she saw a prime time just to walk in there and say, you know what? I don't like you. She could never say it without dementia, but with dementia, she wanted to hurt him for her, him hurting her and for a. The minute somebody would walk past the door, all they'd have to do is walk past and it would jolt her. And and a couple of times, I think they took this. I mean, it happened more than once. Yikes. And so <laughs> I think that, you know, you learn your lessons, but they get stuck in a period of time. I have a like I have some that are 85 years old and I say, how old do you think I am? And they'll say 70. <laughs> and I'll say and then I say, well, how old are you? And they go 35. <laughs> because in their mind, they are younger, way younger, because they don't remember. They go backwards in time. And so they all women think they're way younger <laughs> than what they are. And hey, that's who we really are, kind of. None of us like to see ourselves aging. Well, it's always know, lovely when you look in the mirror. And I, I have a tendency to see my maternal grandmother right. um, because she was my mom was dark brown hair. And I'm obviously blonde. And right. so I remember my gra- my grandmother had the most beautiful silvery white hair. I'm like, if Aww. mine could just gray like that all at once, I'd be fine. Um, Me too. You may be old enough to remember. Do you remember the spun glass uh, t- like Chris- Christmas decorations made of spun oh, glass? Yeah. Okay, I, mm-hmm. I don't think they make that. Anymore. That is what my grandmother's hair looked like. Uh... So, But there are times I look in the mirror and I think, ah, oh, dear. <laughs> She's been gone Who a while. Is Who is this? It's like, what did I, I do wrong? <laughs> I, I know. And you know what? I think those things about dementia, are, it's the same because they just, I had a, a client one time that had a conversation in the, we don't have mirrors anywhere except, of course, in the bathroom because it's a building and you can't just take the mirrors down out of the bathroom. So she was having a conversation with the mirror But the person in the mirror she spoke as as well. So she was speaking as two people. She would ask the person in the mirror something, and then she would be the person in the mirror replying to herself. Well, guess what? The person in the mirror looked old to her. So she was talking to the old person, but she was truly the young person talking to the old person. And I just stood there for a while, and I went, holy moly, this is interesting, but so 
weird because it was a full conversation <laughs> in that mirror, you know? And so, I mean, there's lots of things like that, that I think if we could talk to them about things, we'll pick up objects, just say like um, um, we had apples. And so we talked about bobbing apples. So we had a red apple and we talked about bobbing apples. And so I don't ever ask them, did you ever bob apples? But did you ever bob for an apple? But I go, wouldn't that be fun just to stick your head in a bucket of water and try to get that apple? And they go, oh, we used to do that. But if I would have said, you know, let's talk about bobbing for apples. They might would have looked at me and went, but if you describe that activity, describe it in great detail, it might not be true, such as the Christmas story, but at least it gives them a feeling of purpose. And to me, dementia doulas can give purpose to someone that has none because we don't allow people most of the time living with dementia to have a purpose. And that purpose is many different things. Just just to help me pick up the trash, help me to put pass out straws, help me to find out what they did for a living. We've had bankers, attorneys, secretary of states, you know, I mean, we've had a whole gambit of people through our program that did many different things, but it took a while to get them there. Like if I know we have an attorney there, we'll talk about law, you know, and so we do have one now. So I said, will you be my attorney if I have to just have one and they go, well, I don't know. And I said, well, I'm going to tell you, you know, I get parking tickets. And then that goes off on a story on parking tickets and how many has had a parking ticket. And then for him, I'll say, you're going to be wealthy being here at the veranda because they all are going to have to hire you to get them out of these parking. He just laughed. Did it make sense to people with good brains? I use that word loosely sometimes, (laughs) you know, but subjective, (laughs) subjective. Yeah. Subjective. But who cares? I don't care. And I think that's kind of that um, I, I bend it end of life with clients. I stay with them through the end of their life for the most part. And and hospice will ask me, well, what do you think? And I go, I, you're the hospice nurse. And she goes, no. <laughs> they go, but you're the dementia whisperer. It, was she like this? Was she not like this? I said, I, I wouldn't do that. But I can tell you that she's not comfortable laying there like that because she doesn't like her hair messed up. It's simple things like that, that that if you keep them looking the way they want to look, if they don't care, don't don't mess with it. If makeup never meant anything to a woman, don't try to put her into makeup. But if she did give her the opportunity to be who she used to be, and it might trigger a memory. It's all about the personhood, who they were, the values they held. Um Did they like animals? Did they, (laughs) you know, all kinds of things that you just find out by a mechanical cat that sits in someone's lap and they just talk and love on that mechanical cat. And for all the world, they think it's real and we'll start talking to it. So you just have to find out. That's okay. But even we have one that's a little dog that barks. They love it because that little dog just barks at them. Do they really think it's not? I don't know. I don't know. But I know this. It gives them great joy. And um, and dementia is that disease that has very little joy from the get go, from the diagnosis. Everything just goes shoo, negative, negative, yep. negative. There's nothing good about it. Negative, negative. We have to learn to make it good in some ways. And, um, you know. I've sat here and my phone's laying here and there's been like three phone, three texts come through. Mom's feeling better. She'll be back. Mom, this what's for lunch tomorrow. So you're that liaison with their families too. You know, it's a great relationship and I have great relationships with my families. They know if I tell them something like hospital, well, what do you think? They want to do this. And I'd say, well, the nurse in me comes out and I go, well, if it were my mother, this is what I would do. I don't say not do it. I just say, this is what I did. This is what I would not do. When it comes to medications, I'm a lot bolder. Like, no how doll. <laughs> 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 Forget how doll. It's their enemy. It's their enemy. It works quick. It does what they want it to. 
medically, but for the person living with dementia, it's their enemy. Yeah. It just it's, is. So, in so, my opinion, I'll put it that way. I've never seen it work well. I'll just put it that way. I agree with you. So the yeah. program that you're part of, is it like an adult day program? It's kind of like adult day program, but it's a respite program. The In and around here, Tennessee and Alabama and Georgia, we have tried to, um, we are part of a church as far as we're our own separate nonprofit, but the church allows us to use the building. So there's the overhead cost isn't so much. We are licensed under adult daycare, but they waive the license for adult daycare and have respite licensing, which is just four hours a day, a certain amount of people, um, different, you know, record keeping and things like that, because it works. I mean, respite works. It It's a short time, but it works. And they have four hours of time to do do any we exercise we change about every 20 minutes we change what we're doing we have lunch they get to choose what they want for lunch if they don't like something they don't have to eat it and so eventually during covid we had to close for a few months we painted the room green we had had it a yellow so we decided we'd switch to green when we did and they came back i wondered would they notice it and so they walked in and they went <laughs> They knew Something, it was different. Something's different. Something's different. Yeah, something's <laughs> different. And it was the paint. And I said, do y'all like our new green? We knew something. This is pretty. I mean, if you treat them like they're human beings and you treat them like their opinion is valid, if validation therapy is the best thing I know. Because if you validate someone, that's being a good doula. That's a good doula. Even at end of life doulas validate their fears, validate their joy. You just validate who they are. And I'm, I know it sounds simplistic. <laughs> it doesn't work all the time, but for the most part, for the most part, it does. It does. What's the best way that you would recommend a family caregiver to, to like learn how to do that, to validate, to find their stories? Because, you know, you get so caught up in the day-to-day -day care and, you know, and I, and I don't, I'm trying to compare raising my daughter to dealing with my mom is like, I think that you're part of the stories when you're raising a child. It's like, you know, their first words, their first, all that stuff. And right. obviously we don't have that, you know, well, we have it in reverse with dementias because right. that's just the disease. But I think we, we need to figure out a way of changing our perspective and our focus, which I think would help ease the burden emotionally. Yes. So how do you, you have any good tips on how you think somebody should go that way? <laughs> might be another hour, but that's okay. <laughs> it might be a while. Yeah, I know. We don't have, but you know what? I think that if we see them as, as Bishop Carter says, if we see them as a person, I'll just say this. When someone is diagnosed with colon cancer, we do not look at that person and say, oh, no, they'll say, it's so sad. Colon cancer is bad. Going to have to have surgery and you're over it. That scar is, you know, I mean, you can go into all kinds of great medical terms with that. But when you say dementia, it automatically throws up a, a big, big red flag. And you think, oh, gosh, my life is going to be a living hell now. Bar none. They're going to do this, 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 this and this. And so and it it doesn't always work that way. And so I think we we shortchange them. The whole medical community shortchanges a person living with dementia. I, I, for instance, there's a set of three medications that hospice uses. I love hospice. I'm not against hospice. I love hospice. A set of medications they use for people with dementia. So last week I go to the ER with a client who's frontal temporal lobe. And I said, don't give him these three because it doesn't work on him. We already know it. I've had this family two years. These three do not work. And I'd be Jack Spratt if they mm -hmm. didn't do it anyway. Once your back was turned. Because, you know, and then they wondered why he slept for a whole day. And, and for someone 
who sleeps 24 to 28 hours, who's used to going and blowing all the time, the first thing they say is, well, this is just it. When it really isn't just it, it's the medication, the wearing off. And so this is what I tell people. If you think about a brain that cannot process data, it cannot tell you what day of the week it is. It cannot tell you, I need to go to the restroom. It cannot tell you, oh, I've gone to the restroom. But we give it so many drugs that it's supposed to process the data from all that medication. It doesn't work. It, it, it can't process all that data. If it can't process left foot, right foot, left <laughs> foot, right foot, how is it going to process all those chemicals? I'm a huge proponent for not so many chemicals. Let's try something different. Yeah. Like I saw a cool thing the other day. A friend of mine was in the hospital and she had this thing on her shirt. And I thought, what the heck is that? She goes, have you seen these? Because they know what I do. And they go, these are tabs that a company makes and hospitals are using them. And you pull that tab and it was a little piece of gauze that was soaked in lavender. Ah, and you lavender. stick it on the pillow or you stick it on their gown. So when they lean over at night, they're smelling that oil, that essential oil. You can put it wherever, right here. So we all walk around with those on us. People think that we've got a, a price tag on us, but, <laughs> but, but we're not for sale, but it works. I've sent them home and they're on a roll out thing and you can tear them off. And you can um, just, I give some support group to the families, like to the to the caregivers. I'll say, here, put this on your pillow, put this on your gown. See, if walk around in the daytime and just smell, just smell it. It'll calm you. And lavender is really good. Lavender works well, but we got to try it. I mean, it isn't Seroquel, but, but it, if it doesn't work, it doesn't leave you in the state. Seroquel leaves you in either. That's and you're true. not going to fall. And you're not going to fall from it. It just won't work. But for people that I've given it to, they love it. And then just you and I, just to calm down. You know, <laughs> I mean, at the end of the day, I'm about stressed out sometimes. And so I'll just sit there and put it right there. I'll just hold it and smell it. It's great. It's great. And a hospital company um, is the one that makes them. So I'll send you the name of it because I can't think of saving my soul now. But um, but they have all kinds. They have some that's real light smelling, help you think clearer, think, you know. So anyway, but we try anything. We try anything. We I actually did, did a whole episode on um, how to use essential oils in dementia care. Uh -huh. And I have lavender spray that uh -huh. we use in like not on the pillows, but I spray it near the pillows. Uh -huh. And we go to bed and it's just, it's like, ah, it smells so good. And it tr kind of, I think, triggers your mind. It's like, oh, it's bedtime because right. we've, now we're smelling this, oh, bedtime because that's when we use it. So it's just like, it's almost like muscle memory. Now we're going to take a quick break for an ad. These ads help me continue to bring the show to you for free. When I learned that despite eating as healthy as possible, we can still have undernourished brains, I was frustrated. I also live in a farming community, so I'm aware that our food isn't grown as well as we need. Learning about Neuro Reserves, Relevate, and how it's formulated to fix this problem convinced me to give them a try. Now I know many of you are skeptical, as was I. However, I know it's working because of one simple change. My sweet tooth is gone. I didn't expect that, and it's not something other users have commented on, but here's some truth. My brain always wanted something sweet. Now fruit usually did the trick, but not always. One bad night's sleep would fire up my sugar cravings so much they were almost impossible to ignore. You ever have your brain screaming for a donut? Well, for me, those days are gone. It's been about six months since I started taking the supplement and I have no regrets. I believe in my results so much that I'm passing on my 15% discount to you. Try it for two or three months and see if you have a miraculous sweet tooth cure or maybe just better focus and clarity. It's definitely worth a try. Now back to our conversation. It is. And I, and I think if people would, would try things holistically, I, I mean, I'm, I'm not miss holistic. I don't have a banner over my head, but this other hasn't worked well 
together. So it's worth a try. You know, anything is worth a try holistically to just to see. But and we put I did a rollerball of um, some essential oils. And so I just tell the ladies, I go, oh, smell this new cologne. And I'll rub it around the back of their neck, up the back of their spine, you know. And I said, can I just put some of that there so it's not on their arms and they won't. And they just would calm down. They just would. And so does it happen every time? No. But but for the most part, I'll take a little calm better than no calm. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know. <laughs> And when you have 15 people with dementia in one room, you're going, okay, we've got to keep things as calm as we can. But, you know, the doula part of it is 15 people can sit in a room if you know them well and all have a grand time from beginning to near end stage. Some on hospice, they still can play shuffleboard. They can still play cornhole. They can still play horseshoes. They can still do those things they always did. It's just viewed from a different perspective. Who cares if it doesn't go around or in the hole? We say, if you get it on the board, it's five points. If you get it in the hole, it's three points. So if they get more points, if it hits the top of the board, which is what most of them are going to do. So they don't think they're a failure. They've won. Everybody likes to win, even those people living with dementia. So that's kind of, again, dementia doula, knowing the person, a relationship with them, a relationship with the family, you're in the middle and you're walking side by side with them, trying to figure out this journey that no one asked for. The person with dementia didn't ask for it, nor did the family ask for it. That is true. Is there a, like a national association where like those of us that are not in Tennessee could find a doula that might be able to help walk with us on this journey? Um, You know, the the doulas that I, um, I'll give this number because this is the longest. I'll have to look this up for you. I know it sounds like crazy, but I never say it right. And so <laughs> I want to get this one right. Um, I'm going to teach a course. It's called International Doula Life Movement.com. Mm-hmm. And they have a lot of different doulas. They have birth doulas. They have end of life doulas, but um, we're doing a course, a fall course on dementia as a prerequisite. And then there is, um, okay, I-N-E, Anelda, I-N-E-L-D-A. I think they might have one. I'm working on one. I'll do, I'm going to do it privately, but I'll also be doing it on this one. And I think for caregivers, CNAs, they're never given enough education to figure out what the heck they have to do. And in the community setting, they're just there to do menial tasks. And if they would allow them to become a dementia doula and have some authority, as far as I know this person, I know how to get her to do this. Miss Jones will respond to me if I do this, but it's very time time oriented task that gets the job done these doula tasks are going to have to be relationship based. And so I I just think it'll work. I know it's worked. I've done it 20 years. I know, I know that it works. And I, you know, I know we're getting close on the end. There was a lady who would not come in the program in Texas that I, that I worked in. She just did not want to get out of the car. She didn't like her caregiver, but she loved her. It was this love hate relationship, but she loved old movies. She loved Gone with the Wind. And so I couldn't get her out of the car one day. And I said, Scarlett, come on, Scarlett, get out of this car. She goes, shut up, Melanie. She went right into the mode of the movie. And I said, now you've hurt my feelings, Scarlett. Red's in that building. We've got to go see Red. He's waiting on you. Melanie, shut up. And I said, Please, Scarlett, please, Scarlett. And then I got real Southern with it. She goes, <laughs> all right, if Rhett's not in there. But by the time we got out of the car and walked up and got in, I said, well, let me go see if I can find Rhett. She went and got her something and she was fine. Fast forward, she passed away. I go into the funeral home. I'm at the back of the funeral home. The family's at the front. And her daughter looks up to me and says, oh, my goodness, Melanie, Scarlett's gone home. <laughs> that is a doula relationship with that family. 
the daughter got it. She knew if she talked to her like she was Scarlet or some other movie, she loved all movies. Then you could reach her because she was an avid movie. She could recite all kinds of things. But to say that was like saying, job well done, job well done. Scarlet's gone home. Melanie's getting recognition, but it has nothing to do with me. It has to do with it worked for her. Scarlet had gone. And so that's kind of that doula relationship type thing. You can get through a lot of things if you know who they are, if you know who, and you respect them and you love them and you care about them. And that's the doula can do that and not be a threat where you, the daughter could not do that. You were, you were that daughter bossing her around. (laughs) Telling her what to do. And and by the way, that's the whole thing, too. I'm your mama. Who do you think you are bossing me around? I changed your diaper. So I, I just think that it works. I know it has for me. I know it has for everyone that's worked for me. Um, I think it'll work. I agree. My mom thought I was her best friend, so I didn't get the resistance of who the hell do you think you are trying to tell me what right. to do. But there was this formality kind of barrier because, right. you know, there are certain things you don't, you might do with your daughter that you're not going to do with your best friend. Exactly. You know, she didn't like to hold hands. She didn't like all that touchy feely stuff. Cause that's, that's not how we are with our friends. Right. So that, that was, that was hard because, you know, they always say, well, rub their hands or do this. I'm like, no, cause my, my mom was not going to accept that from her friend. <laughs> and you know what? Then that is what, That's where we get into trouble is that's not who your mother was. So roll along with it and say, who cares? I have to do what I have to do to get this person living with dementia who happens to be my mama, who happens to be my mom, to have the best life she can have. And that's what we're in it for is to give some quality of life and a legacy to someone that deserves it. Everyone has a legacy. Watched Queen Elizabeth's service all morning. This will date this podcast, but (laughs) it's it's still the truth. (laughs) It's still the truth. And I watched all of the legacy. I've cried more at the legacy part (laughs) of the things they talked about because, you know, I'm sad the queen passed away. But I looked at all of that legacy years and thousands of years. Something was like six. I mean, it was it was really old. And I'm going, but they're still paying tribute to that statue Mm -hmm. for the person. And so I just think it's a legacy. It's a legacy writing of a person's legacy, which is huge to me. I don't want people to, if I get dementia, I want them to remember me as someone that cared, someone that cared about others, someone that um, I, I like to wear makeup. Don't let me walk around. And this is funny because we have some that don't wear bras. (laughs) <laughs> and so in my end of life paperwork, I want to go, I've written down, do not let me go without a bra. I hate it. I've never done it. It's those little things that make them feel better. I mean, you know, let's just be honest here. When you're 80 years old, you're not perky anymore. <laughs> and so maybe you look flat chested and here sits these little ladies and I'm going, wait a minute, wait a minute, one or two days a week. Her them up. Let her feel whole again. Let her look in a mirror, even if she doesn't know who she is, and say, I'm looking pretty good today. Everybody wants that. It's everyone's right to feel that way. So I don't know if this is what you were looking for for a dementia doula. And well, I just, there's... I, I'd never heard of one. So I'm like, okay, I must, <laughs> I must learn more. <laughs> And you know what? I think some of it is this too. You have to learn that there is some medical things you'll have to learn, things you'll have to learn in the dementia world. Tipa's a great place to mm-hmm. go to her website and people can, it's free. I mean, parts of it. And the certifications that I have, our program is a designated organization for Tipa now. And so she came and visited us. And so we try to do things that, honor those living with dementia. I want to start it now because people will forget if you don't. So um, there's lots of good websites out there for them 
great podcasts like yours. I mean, I listen to more podcasts today than I do sitting and watching them because I can get dressed and listen to one. I don't have to watch somebody. Yep. They don't have to see me. I can get ready. You know, it's a great way of getting information out there. So um, find some great podcasts. Just listen to them. Yep. I, I've been into podcasts since they were, they, once they launched, um, I am a retired portrait photographer. So mm-hmm. I, when podcasts launched, you actually had to listen to them through your web browser. Right. So I have this podcast going on my web browser and Photoshop going and my computer basically saying, yo, <laughs> pick, because just do much task here. So I got, and then, then you, I would listen to them on my phone. But if the, if your phone went to sleep, then the podcast stopped, which was really super annoying. So I got yeah. back into them in 2016, not really sure when pod players came out and I went looking for a podcast in 2017. Because I'm a reader, I love to read, but dang, you know, you can only read so much of the of caregiving I'm, advice books before you just can't. You yeah. go crazy. I mean, there's many that they're newer that have been written. They're short. They're a little bit more workbook style, but That's, it's still it's it, you know like I like to read murder mysteries. <laughs> My well, I, I like just, short stories. My book is short stories about people living with dementia. So I thought if you can, if I can learn from them, other people can learn from someone who had that same. And so perseverance and stuff. And I'm not, if someone gave me war and peace, I'd go, are you crazy? Yeah. I'm not reading. I didn't even read. I mean, you know, big thing. That's just not me. And in the dementia world, you have to look at that. Who is that personality? What does she like? What does she hate? What did she excel in what did she not and then when you know it's part of it so we know not to give you a big long book and give you a murder mystery yeah <laughs> i just finished a book <laughs> i just finished a book and i was like so what's this book about and he goes i know murder right i'm like well so far there's no dead bodies and he's like what and i'm like oh there's huh? mystery but so far there's, <laughs> there's no <mystery>. dead bodies <laughs> the dead body came at the end <laughs> that's so, yeah, true i like i like you know, like what I, do I like, listen, I do, and I listen to true crime podcasts because they're interesting. Especially, and, I like uh, California true crime since I'm in California, right. and occasionally right. they've got some crimes they cover that are like, uh, "Yikes!" I remember that because it was close to home, and then right. I'll like send them a message on social media, and be like, "Yo, you're talking about something that happened miles from my childhood home here." <laughs> uh, I know, I know. But yeah. So, That's, what is the name of your book? My book is called "Remember for Me." So it's a book of short stories about 15 different people. It's the story of my mom and dad and what happened to them, why I got sped into overdrive to help people (laughs) um, living with dementia and the medical system, how to, 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 that's one of the hardest things to me for people with dementia is families is how to, you know, it takes forever to get a diagnosis. Mm Mm-hmm. They still can't say the word dementia. They call it dementia or Alzheimer's. And I want to go, what doctor does not know that it's Alzheimer's? But it's the truth. I'm not bashing the medical community, but but it's still the truth. You have to, there's lots of things we have to learn. And um, I just think I do look and do it. And I I think we have to know who they are, who they are. Well, who they are, that little detective hat. It's it's been a theme lately, so yeah. it must be true. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it is. You're a detective. What makes them be that way? What's causing them to do that? It's like even the food they eat. We just assume they like something such as we have a little lady that doesn't like um, anything but chicken. And I'm going to tell you. If you you can call a piece of turkey chicken and this woman will go, no, that's not that's not chicken, not oh, chicken. She won't eat it. Now, she doesn't go, Marion, this is not chicken. I don't like it. She'll just throw that sandwich over. And I'll know she's saying you're not fooling me. <laughs> that's turkey, you know. So, I mean, it's things like that. Don't say, Mama, you used to love it. Well, she might have, but now she doesn't. So. And the one time that. We had a quote issue. My mom got into the whole resisting showers 
And yeah. just by happenstance, I found out that the staff had changed her from morning to afternoon. And I said, oh, no, 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 no. My mom is not an afternoon shower. If she got into like, you know, repainting a room and it got to a certain point in the afternoon, she'd just, you know, wash her face and throw on some extra deodorant, call it a day. Because why, why bother showering at like three or four o'clock in the afternoon? Yeah. It just, I mean, I'm the same she way. She was an AM shower person. Yeah. So, and when they switched so, her back, the problem yeah. pretty, she was still resistant, but it was better. Right. It was I mean, better. She, and that is just that little, just yeah. that little thing. And, you know, they didn't know. I mean, exactly. You know, half the time their clocks are off. So it, it's just, it's very I interesting. I know. But it is yes, interesting. I would, um, oops, one second. Somehow turned on Siri there. Okay, so <laughs> so remember me who I am. I'm going to make sure that's linked in the show notes so people yeah. can look at it's that. It's called Remember for Me, and it's oh, in Amazon. For me, got it. Amazon, yeah, it's I on remember Amazon. That. <laughs> <laughs> remember, for, you want me to remember for you? <laughs> yes, please. There are days when it's like, <laughs> I know, I know. Trust it's like me. I feel like I have to remember for other people, but you know, my mom's gone, so I, that that's a lot less remembering these days, but. Well, I know. And I'll tell you when I, I've had COVID twice and the, and I knew I had COVID the second time because that COVID fog started the minute COVID did. And I'm telling you, for someone like me who works in it, the minute it started, I went, oh, crap, this got to be COVID <laughs> again, you know, because I couldn't remember anything. I mean, it wasn't like I couldn't remember I had a podcast today. It was like I got up for something. I mean, in a split second gone gone yep. and so i get the fear it's the most dreaded disease there is so i get the fear of it i'm not making light or making it sound simpler than because it's a hard journey but we have to figure out how to take that stigma away from it and work a little harder on some easy things some easy things and hope it helps it helps my program. I'll just tell you that our families and my little people with dementia, it's it's a howdy duty time. I'm just telling you, we have a good time. Doesn't mean we don't have we don't have bad days, but for the most part, for the most part, we have good days. Well, that sounds like it's per perfect place to stop before we talk the afternoon away. <laughs> No, <laughs> and I, I appreciate know. this. I I you sent Marianne an email at random, like I found out about you from so and so because it's so and so. It's like it's like one of those like weird weird sliding into somebody's DM kind of deal. <laughs> <laughs> it's so, okay, you know. I check, and I have had several since since Barbara was on my podcast. Then I um she she and I have you know I I trust her judgment on end of life. For sure. Mm -hmm. and, um, and she will tell you it is a different beast. It's a different it's a different death. It, yep. You can't you throw out all of the EOLDs, the end of life theories, and you start with the dementia theory is it's different. And so I said, well, I'm glad you think so. So how about this dementia doula thing? And she you know, that's really how it started. So not really, but the name of it and things like that. So and then anyway. what's the name of your podcast as well? It's called Aging, Angst, and Hallelujahs. And we camp out on angst a whole bunch. Yeah. <laughs> Life is angst. <laughs> well, I'll, make sure, angst. I'll make sure that the book and your website are all linked in the show notes so people can find you. And if they have more questions about a dementia doula, how to become one, how to find one, Thank they can you. ask you. Thank you Thank so much you. for I joining appreciate me. It. Thank you. You're welcome. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your podcasts.